it's like many other topics and buzzwords. It goes from being a very interesting lens or proposition to everywhere, all the time, without uniform meaning. So, you know, just among my friends and I, we feel like, not that it's corny, authenticity is not corny, but the attempt to implement process or programming, right? Grown ass adults, there are experts coming in to tell you how to be your authentic self at work. So don't say, I just think it's funny. <laughs> Yo, it's, it's funny in so many ways for me too. One, because I think what people really need, including myself, like the way that I found quote unquote authenticity was really just going to therapy. Okay. <laughs> like, because, so there's a lot of inner work that has to happen for you to be authentic, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you don't know who you are, if you don't have a certain level of self-awareness, how then do you know when you're betraying that? How then do you know if you're not living your values, if you haven't identified them? So I'm over here wondering, can a 20 year old be authentic? You know, that stage of life, a lot going on, you're on the cusp, you're an adult, but you haven't fully embraced, depending on your situation, all the intricacies of adulthood. You're figuring a lot of stuff out, you know, those are prime, experimentation years period right so you know there's a and that doesn't ever stop in terms of evolution and growing hopefully am i inauthentic because i'm different than i was 10 years ago so there's just so many facets to this authenticity conversation that i don't understand how the conversation is taking place <laughs> yeah yeah well it's interesting too because that's the first question I typically ask my guests, right? And I always mention like, yeah, it's a buzzword we hear it all the time. In fact, most corporations, they say, we want you to bring your most authentic self, right? But I, just like you, I don't think we often talk about like, well, it's different for everybody. Like literally not one person has said the same definition for what authenticity means to them. But what's interesting too is that I found that most of the people that answer the question, they tie it back to an insecurity that they've had for so long. And authenticity to them is typically them sort of rebelling against what they were told or they, they thought they were forced to be, or it was like what they weren't allowed to do when they were younger. You know what I mean? Mm. That's what I found. But again, those experiences though, like, our families, society, they've all shaped our perception of what we've like, quote unquote, should be. And right. now we're, we're in many ways, we're aiming to like rebel against that. And to your point, like find who we really are. But all that mm -hmm. to say, authenticity for you, like when you think about it, what the hell does it mean to you? Authenticity to me, to me is that when I show up in a space, I am able to act according to my values. That what I believe about myself, about the world, about the context in which I'm in, that I can show up real about that in, in what I say, in how I present myself. Because another thing I think that's missing from this conversation is the very real notion of the roles we play, right? In people's lives, in relationship to other people. So I am very authentic with my parents. <laughs> But <laughs> there's some stuff or some, you know, things I will not share in front of them or with them because out of respect, because, you know, we have different perspectives and it's good to challenge them, but not all the time. I, I don't want that kind of relationship, right? I'm more comfortable with certain friends, uh, you know, when I'm, and that's not to say I'm different people. I'm not, I'm, I'm always myself, but it's your level of connection shapes authenticity too, right? Because there's a level of vulnerability and I'm not just trying to be like a raw open wound, you know, <laughs> with everybody I meet. 
you yeah. know, like only certain people get access to that. So I just think it's interesting to treat us as singular beings who don't ebb and flow, um, you know, in mood, in things that we are passionate about or walk away from, because I don't know about you, but I'm growing. Yeah. I'm changing. I mean, we're, I'm we're all growing. I think, I think if you're lucky. You know, yeah, that is true. If you're lucky. An interesting word that you mentioned is, is values, right? Because as we grow, you know, and our values could change too, but maybe for the most part, they remain semi-consistent, right? Like what are some of those at an early age, what are, what are some of those values that you think were instilled into you or you think you like held on to? Speaking for community or um, holding community at the center when standing up for stuff. That is the thing that makes it easy for me to be um, a rabble rouser, an advocate, a provocateur, is it is not on behalf of myself. It, it, I find it very easy to stand up for others not necessarily for myself. And so I've even had to internalize some of that and say, hey, V, don't let this thing slide because even though you're not pressed about it personally, it impacts a greater group and they're not here to say something. And so I feel like if I'm in that room, I'm gonna need to take up that space to, to center something I know is so important, even if it's not personally a big deal to me. And that's helped me a lot to advocate for myself. When I'm pushing for a raise or a promotion, I'm doing that for all Latinas so that they are viewed in the light of person who should be given a raise, who should be promoted. Also to mirror that behavior. I want young women coming up to see, you have to assert, you need to negotiate. Don't just be contenta with whatever they throw your way. So um, like love of others helps me act on behalf of myself. And I got that from my mother. Um, tell, me, tell me about your mom. Like what sort of behaviors or instances did you see that in action? You know, I, I think it's probably not that uncommon if you are the child of an immigrant um, mom, which is um, it's never about just us. So you know what, there are going to be some people crashing on the couch for a while till they get their papers sorted. Yeah. Oh you my know? God. My apartment, I feel like apartments for immigrant households are like hotels. Like it's always the first stop and they may Listen, stay a little longer than you expect, you know, that basement though, <laughs> you know, a temporary address for a lot of folks acclimating to a new world. And, and almost needing to learn the rules before going out there and trying to get a, a regular real apartment. Um, so anything f like that to, you know, and, and some of this might be Latina, Catholic, like, you know, a lot of moms be on that martyr thing. <laughs> you know, they do everything for everybody else. But uh, what I felt like was my mom, my mom did not want to be um, holdona. Like she says, she didn't want to cause a problem. She didn't want to fight landlords for tenants' rights. She didn't want to have to, uh, you know, go to uh, the welfare office, but she had to for others or for self. And so then it's like, she could not bear an injusticia. She could not bear injustice. I know no one will do it today, but my mom used to pick up somebody just walking with their groceries. I knew, you know, it's raining. Hey, move for, for the lady. We're gonna give her a ride home. Just my mom, my mom, and you know, I want her to think about herself more but she's just always thinking about others more. And that gives her a real sense of purpose and service. And, um, you know, sometimes when I wasn't trying to be like that, when I'm like, I actually have plans, I'm not trying to go translate uh, for the neighbor. My mom's like criticism of me was tan americana. Wow. How did that make you feel at the time? I mean, I would get a little hot because I'm like, well, you came here for me to not have to do all this like labor, right? Like I'm just, you know, I'm 12 years old. I'm trying to do my homework. And I'm also going to appointments with people I don't know to translate medical yeah. situations, yeah. right? Because to my mom, it's like community, community, what do they need? And I'm kind of like, wait first before community, um, am I okay to do this, right? And so I, where I'm at now is I have learned how to, reconcile and find the opportunities to really show up and to know when 
I don't have the stamina or emotional bandwidth to do it. I will not run myself ragged because then I am of no use, <laughs> you know? Pero yeah, I remember my mom, tan americana, tan blanca, straight up slur for not putting aside my own plans, my own ambitions for others. And that's, you know, in our community, that's good and bad. We also get held back by that financially. Yeah. I mean, you even, know, <laughs> even in corporations, the idea of ERGs, um, I think they often get tasked with things that like aren't necessarily like it shouldn't be for them. For example, the last time I was in the ERG, I quit became, because I was frustrated with it, it felt like I was in politics, right? Like there was this, I, th there was a corporate initiative from the top to say, we want ERGs to be more than food flags and fun, essentially is what they said. And in my head, I was like, okay. So I was like, what do y'all want us to do? And the idea was like, well, we want y'all to focus on professional development and community outreach and recruiting initiatives and all these things. And in my head, I'm like, I'm like, bitch, ain't that your job? Ain't that the organization's job? <laughs> like why should it be like if we want to dedicate our budget to have fun celebrate our flags and for once not eat a charcuterie board and have our food like mm -hmm. let's like let us do that like we shouldn't be responsible for these other things like you're you're giving us the responsibility that you already have teams dedicated and you're paying them to do those things right so right. I think somebody on the podcast called it a double tax previously but it's it's a similar idea yes so, you know, I'm, I'm in one of those ERGs. And what I love about it is that every time we're figuring out programming, is it for us? Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and, and we're like, what do we want for us? You know, there's budget, there's, we need community, we need camaraderie, we need spaces where we don't need to translate or what have you. And then there are the, what do we want other people to know? What do we want to expose our colleagues to? What's a conversation they're not having? Yes, it's some labor on our part, but it's important to us. Um, but to your point, uh, food, festival, fun, claro que yes, you know, alliteration is amazing. We need that because what we need is community and community right. is not, how are we going to recruit more people? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, that's, man, these that's funny. BRG. That's a real situation. I'm, I'm fascinated by the idea of you at such a young age, seeing the representation of your mom. And, you know, you didn't describe her as this, but I'm, you know, let me know if these are appropriate. She's bold, outspoken, unselfish, right? But in, it kind of goes away from, I think, the trope of advice that a lot of immigrant families give their children. It's like, keep your head down, do the work, don't stand out. Because if you stand out, there's like a fear in that, right? So mm -hmm. as you entered corporate America, like you have this value that you were taught, but then it's like, do you bring that into work? Like, how did you deal with that? I very much was raised with that perspective from my mother. Well, my father, same household, <laughs> okay. head down, be grateful, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. work hard, you'll be recognized. And that's very much true in academia. So in school, top honors all the time, they weren't worried about me. You're going to be somebody, you know, you're going to be the first to go to college. That's not the real world, right? School is a completely different animal. The, the notion of a meritocracy, get cute, right? It's a different game. So my mom instilled, when I had those teenage jobs, you know, I've been working since I was 14, you know, supermarkets, whatever. When she felt they were abusing me, or, you know, kind of exploiting my availability. She'd just be like, quit. Wow. Like, right? We, a very, mom was very Gen Z. This is not, <laughs> yeah. you know, mom was like, this is not serving me. And I'm like, girl. So, you know what? I had a lot of jobs that I worked as long as they served me. And then I would go travel for two months, you know, wow. just, you know, but my mom is very, one, very much one of those one life. Mm. Um, when she was employed for many years with the federal government, she was very close to the union steward, Eliona. Okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, it's just our instinct. And, and both of my siblings are entrepreneurs because they're not very successful people. And I was one too, till I went agency side, um, because we don't do things other people's way. Um, we have our own way of moving through the world. Um, and in corporate, but did you I start 
did you go, did you have like corporate like internships and then you did entrepreneurship for a long time or you went straight into entrepreneurship? Yeah. Was it those early jobs like at a supermarket for example you were like I'm just different like I just work different like how, how did you just jump into entrepreneurship reluctantly marketplace uh, you know just graduated when things weren't great um uh, everybody was, was buying that? was that like financial crisis time around there uh, 2003 so it. it's, okay. it's not 2008 problems yeah but it's it, but its own batch of problems and so and you know where I was it just there wasn't a lot of opportunity so I had to create some so very common now, everybody can start freelancing. People in school start all the services I offered, writing, editing, translation, early aughts, social media. I got in very early. And that's really the reason why I'm even in advertising now is I got in there through, um, you know, basically sneaker culture um, and that evolved because I was providing those services of strategy, content management, community management, all these kinds of things in the wild west of web 2.0. And I never worked for anybody. So then an agency calls up and of course I'm like, no way, how am I going to shift from doing things my own way, living my life loud to a massive organization that has, you know, however many thousands of people around the world. Yeah. You know, um, huge shift. And what do you, what do you massive. mean living your life loud as well? I'm curious. Well, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you, you're doing things on your terms. So, mm -hmm. you know, you can show up however, looking however you look, and people are going to want to work with you either because of that. Or it serves as a filter. You know what? We're probably not compatible. You know, but regardless, you don't need to come to terms with it. Right. When you go, but when you're an entrepreneur, really, it's not that you don't have a boss. You have hundreds of them. <laughs> every, <laughs> every client is your boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And not for nothing, I'm not trying to go back to that. No. Like I like, and I, this is, I differ from my brother and sister who are, you know, my sisters expand, both of them are expanding. I'm over here like, you know what? I love not keeping track of all those receipts. Um, <laughs> and I still do. I have other streams of income stuff I do, but I love the weight that's removed from simply getting to be and do as opposed to juggling sales, customer service, marketing, you know, all these things when you're a one person show. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about yeah. you're comfortable living that lifestyle for a moment and, or yeah. for a bit, you're enjoying it. Yeah. And then you get the call, you, you start getting the thoughts around, is this going to work? And what are some of those thoughts that come up and tell me about like, you know, when you, when you first start, what was that like? So I went through all the things, which was, do I need to change who I am to be a part of this? Let me go through these questions. I asked my partner, a very long time partner about it, but he doesn't have a clue because he's been an entrepreneur for the last 20 years. So the mm -hmm. last time he worked, like in the 90s and your boy is like all I can tell you is that when I went to work and wore a bright shirt or a bright tie everybody would comment on it I don't recommend you do that you want to be known for what you're bringing to the table maybe you don't bring all that other stuff and I was like hmm and you know again in the 90s don't have tattoos don't have piercings things where I'm like I don't think that's a big deal anymore you know I this remember is 20 I remember being in college and they would say, like, don't wear bright colored shirts because it's going to distract from the meeting. Okay. So like, Aquí estoy. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. So I just want to yes. empathize with you that like, I've heard similar feedback. And it's not wrong. Mm. I, I know that by wearing a neutral color, you will stay focused on my message and less focused on my appearance. But in my case, this color is emblematic and representative of so much of me, of my choices to um, get dopamine hits right as soon as I wake up in the morning to the way that I shield myself or arm myself for the day, that I think it's important for you to know that. So I know all the right things to do. And in some instances, you know what? I am gonna wear the neutral because I don't want any excuses about why you didn't hear what I was saying. I'm not going to give people any levers. So there's just a lot around communication, presence. You need to know the rules in order to break them. 
So I'm glad I didn't show up with a bright red shirt to my first interview, you know, out of college. You know, I'm glad I did that, you know, that somebody felt the need to tell me, but I'm glad that I have found my own way and know when to pull out, you know, the black or the whatever. Um, you know, as someone who does a lot of public speaking, I come across a lot of people who are professionals in guiding you on your personal brand, <laughs> what you should wear on a stage versus on film. There are all kinds of standards. Like what? Well, you know, communication is basically only like 5% what you're saying. It's largely body language. Um, it's posture. It's so many things, but it's also packaging. We in particular, if this is true with human beings, we evaluate the presentation of information based on the messenger. You know, there's a classic anecdote about the, you know, big short the book, the movie, mm -hmm. that the person who tried to warn everyone who saw the data, this is going to happen. Y'all can't keep running around the housing market like this. Y'all can't keep doing this. He was screaming it for three years. Pero he was nerdy. He had some big coat glasses. He was not somebody necessarily that you would be drawn to the way they say it. Once someone else who is a different presentation put it forth, I mean, it doesn't matter, it was too late. We could have avoided, we could have avoided a whole situation had this one person been listened to. And it's a very human thing. So my thing is what's worth fighting for when we talk about bias? And that's what it is. That's what it is. And I try to, I try to tell people all the time that like we all have bias. It's natural. I, I forget what you said, but it's like, it's a human reaction. It's natural, right? Like I always give the example, I go into a cafe, I go to cafes all the time, right? And like, yeah. if my cafe, if my barista at a cafe doesn't look pretty much homeless or like a Brooklyn hipster, like I'm not going to trust the coffee. coffee. Yeah, exactly. That's but it, it takes a certain level of self-awareness to recognize the bias before you take the action. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because there's not, there's, because professionalism is just defined as a skill or competence needed for a role, right? So right. there's nothing about the person's appearance that indicates that they're not, that they don't have the skill or the competence. It's based on my bias that I don't believe a person that looks like a, a nerdy stockbroker, right? Like there's no, but that's just based on my bias. So I love that example. But yeah, I just want to point out that it's natural. Everyone has it. And it actually is why we survive, right? Mm -hmm. Bias is you have been in the world, you've seen things happen, you know how it plays out oh, thing that looks this way equals that. Yeah. We categorize, we label. These are all things that throughout evolution served to keep us safe and alive and prospering in community. Are we going to expect 9 billion people to unlearn their bias? <laughs> it or takes a long we, time. <laughs> or are we going to recognize that we all have it and make deliberation about when and where you want to stand up and like challenge it. Cause I do think it's important to challenge bias, but that's not what my life's going to be. I'm not going to be, you know, um, going out of my way to educate others with my presence. Um, because that's an energy drain, right? Like it's one thing to just be yourself. It's another thing when that then invites questions. One of the funniest things to me, and it always has been, is people who do severe body modification. Ooh, you know, a couple mean? horns, you know, they'll put some horns, get like a face tattoo, like okay. pretty, pretty legit, you know, changes to the structure of their human form. Sure. So do you know what I'm talking about? Like the people put like little horns, bumps get their, you know, cut their tongue, mm. put black lenses in. So stuff that makes them look, you know, non-human. There's the reptile man. There's people who just do all yeah. of these kinds of, and then they're like, what are you looking at? <laughs> really? You are an anomaly. You chose mm -hmm. for, you know, your aesthetic, whatever. You like that. That's cool. But when we walk around thinking nobody should react, Nobody should be looking. That's crazy talk. That's not, yeah. you cannot expect that of human beings. Yeah. It, well, I, in a more simplistic example, right? Like if that's an quote unquote extreme example, right? right? That is extreme. Yeah. I, I remember I did a speaking engagement the other day and a woman said, well, like, I don't want to be the only one, let's say, for example, to wear like a pink shirt to work, for example, mm -hmm. right? 
-hmm. or I don't want to be the only one that wears my curly hair to work because I'm going to get a shocking reaction like that. She was like, oh, I've never seen someone wear curly hair, right? But I think the powerful thing in that example is that what if she wasn't the only one though? What if we, if many people in the office really loved wearing bright color shirts, for example, but no one feels comfortable enough to do it because of these beliefs that we've been trained to believe around professionalism, right? I think there would be less microaggressions and like people being shocked mm -hmm. if we normalize it. Like, I think we have the power to normalize a lot of things, but I think it takes representation like you to inspire someone else to do it. And then it creates this ripple effect of normalization of whatever we want. Not that it's right. easy. Not that I, I'm like, racism is going to go away tomorrow if we all wear pink shirts. Like, that's not the thing, right? But there are certain things that I think we can normalize that aren't as extreme as like the reptile man. Right. Yeah. And sorry, last point I think is that like, if you look at diversity numbers, right, there's I don't know, I'm just making this up, right? Like most of the organizations have like 5% black, 5% Hispanic, right? And I'm generalizing, right? Like, I don't think white people know what it's like to work with, a, with, with black people or Hispanic people because most of us don't show up authentically, whatever authentic means to you, right? So the, the day when we finally do reveal ourselves, mm. people are shocked, but then we get upset that they're shocked. But like, wouldn't you be shocked if you like show up as a completely different person one day compared to like how you showed up? Cause that's what I did. Like I literally, I remember when I was working at Facebook, I had a meeting with my coworkers and I was like, y'all been lying to y'all for the past year. And like, they were like, what are you talking about? I was like, literally every, like I, I lied to y'all. Like starting today, I'm gonna start being more of myself. But like, it was kind of shocking at first because they've got to know a version of me that wasn't me. I think it would be less shocking if like more of us. One of my biggest pieces of advice is like, please do not show up as somebody else in an interview because that's bait and switch. Yeah. It's like catfish, professional catfish. Yo, professional catfishing. <laughs> you know, and I'll, I'll see it on message boards, advice boards. I have this color hair or, you know, people bought wearing wigs to cover their, you know, blue hair. Sure. It's like, no, like we live in a world where blue hair is largely okay. Just depends on your um, industry. Really, you're going to wear a wig. How do you think that's going to be a week later when you don't wear that wig? Right. You know, because you're, you are presenting a package. You are presenting yourself as you want people to receive you as that. And then, yeah, like I'm not with it. You know what you're talking about? I didn't experience that in corporate America because by the time I got into corporate America, it's, I'm too far gone. <laughs> I'm too far gone. I tr trust if I had gotten into this business in my 20s, I would have gone through all of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Because even, even, you know, when I'm getting hired in my 30s, I'm, I'm like reading books. I'm, you know, two day prime, Amazon, uh, you know, how to show up in an interview right? How to um, not blend in, but you know, the first 90 days, yeah. you know, I had all the little flashcards for the first 90 days. So I, I totally get it. And even as someone who's like pretty self-assured and know who she is, had the moment of like, oh, do I take out? I mean, I, I took my hoop out and sw um, swapped it for a, a stud. It was like, maybe, and nobody ever said anything. And then I was like, oh, okay, I'll put the hoop back in. You know, there were little adjustments I made, but not really. Like, you know, porque I don't want who I am to be a problem. I rather we, I rather we not even start dating. Yeah. You know? Well, I love the, I love the idea that you said that it's also a filter for like finding out like who's with you and who's not. Yeah. And there's, there's a different level of like swag and confidence and just experience right like you have a resume that you've built up for a certain amount of time so by the time you got into corporate not only are you confident but you're you're in a leadership position you have a resume built out so it's it is a little bit different um I'm, I'm curious for you too like something you said that was so powerful is like you feel like there's kind of like a story behind the colors that you wear and like there's a reason why you get dressed up right or quote unquote dressed up whatever that means right but like you get energy from that oh, I'm yes. wondering for, like how did you find out 
that you get that dopamine hit from, you know, wearing various colors or dressing up right. and, and not wearing sweatpants. Yeah, yeah. I've never done the sweatpants thing, but so I've always intuitively felt it. I could tell the difference between, you know, and I wore a lot of black as a, as a young, angry teen, okay? And flannel and the baggy pants, I did the whole thing. Fiddle, I noticed the difference when putting on, you know, a flowery dress as opposed to, you know, solid color shorts and a t-shirt. This is going back 20 years. Then I, the research came out <laughs> Um, giving this process and this very real thing a name is called enclosed cognition. They've done so many studies on the white lab coat doctors wear, perception of self, how they feel wearing that lab coat, but also how they're received. You know, stethoscope <laughs> changed the game. So I learned intuitively, I didn't have any proof. I just knew that certain things, you know, Maybe a necklace that had meaning, you know, the hoops that I always wore when something great happened that became kind of like lucky charms. You know, you have these little things that you start to acquire over your lifetime. And then, you know, as that viral video of the outfits over two years of being stuck at home shows, it is a very deliberate act every morning to go into my closet, which is obviously organized by color and say, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? Because, you know, day, days are different. Sometimes the weather affects it. If it's really, really gray out, sometimes I'm like, I'm going to internalize that or I'm going to counter it. I'm going to be sun. I'm going to be sunshine for everybody I come in contact with. Um, you know, other times it's, oh, I've got a pitch. I need to kill this. I know exactly the power suit that I'm wearing. That is a very real phenomenon um, that I've been lucky enough to know about, even if I didn't ever have a name for it. And it has served me so well. It just gives me posture, you know? Ever since I was a little girl, people were like, you stand so straight. I just, there's something, you know, which is like, what? <laughs> what a strange thing to get complimented on. Um, it's because I'm short. I'm very petite. <laughs> okay. and, and petite, okay. everyone thinks I'm tall. So they're like, you have tall person energy. Tall person. And then, <laughs> tall person energy, but I'm 5'2". Oh, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I would have. Met, I mean, it's one of those things that you know, in the Zoom culture, that's one of the big reveals when you meet somebody in person. It's yes, like, it oh, is. I wonder. I remember when I first met my colleagues at my last job. You're like, we're all making bets around like who's the tall, who's gonna be the tallest person. Yeah. it's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Everybody loses this bet. <laughs> yeah. They're like, oh, she must be six three. She's six. Yeah, uh, right. Stupid tall. Yeah, no, little nugget. I've also had some like viral posts on LinkedIn and. The best part for me about virality or just like, you know, things getting a lot of views is not necessarily the number of views, but the number of messages that I get or comments, right? And I'll be honest, yes, there are some haters, but for the most part, <laughs> it is so, and I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it, like Same. encouraging, Same. inspiring, like one, one post in particular that I'm like, I <laughs> Like my background, I can feel the shit. Um, when I when I posted my salary transparently, it was a Dominican student or like young in his career. He said, I didn't know someone that looked like me could make that much money. Like, what sort of messages did you get in that post? Honestly, you know, I also have goosebumps. You never know who's watching. Yeah. You just don't. And it's a silly little thing that I set out early in the pandemic with the thought, you know what? I'm going to be stuck at home for a few years. And I, and I knew that I, I want something joyful to come out of this. I want some record that showed that I didn't just like wither away and wilt at home. And I say that as somebody who suffered immense tragedy during, like if we put the real, real as a background to sort of the beautiful outfits and looks, mad death, lots of family members, you know, very impacting. So point being, you know, cause there were some haters. That got me through one of the darkest periods in American history where we let 1 million people die because it is a form of resilience to be intentional, to know what you need. I know what I need to give it to myself every day without apology. Um, but the notes that I got that still people feeling, one thing that I struggle with is that people feel like they need permission. Like it makes me sad. 
a little bit sad when people are like, yeah. now I can. And it's like, no, you always could. But you know what? I'm really happy this moment happened. Yeah. You gave it to them, though. And, yeah. and, and I know it doesn't always feel like <laughs> it, it, it feels weird to say that, like, yeah, like people need permission. But I mean, what's that? What's that saying? It's like you can only be what you can see. Like see, some mm-hmm. people just don't know it's possible right. um, to be someone at your level to not always wear black and gray and dark blue. Right. Right. <laughs> So there was everything, the range from the testimonials of, I felt alone because I was doing it and everybody comments on it every day and it's annoying. So the few people sort of held out and felt a little ostracized or kind of uh, made fun of or, or whatever, all the way to, I've actually lost myself. I used to be that. The last two years took away a lot from me. To people sharing photos so weird, of you inspired me. Look how I dressed to work today. So many dope outfit photos. <laughs> I mean, head to toe, the lip, the shoe. Yeah. I mean, just so great. And even a lot of men, you know, mm-hmm. who probably feel even more pressure than women to not wear color, right? Mm-hmm. Because of all the implications there might be or whatever. It or was so and all that, yeah. All the things that are wrapped up in a shirt. Um, So it was just really beautiful and illuminating and it did different things for different people. But I just love that it was as simple as you inspired me to start wearing uh, my lipstick, which I used to wear. But for some reason, I just stopped with Zoom to I I feel like I stopped caring about myself and I put all that clothes away. And now I'm going to break it out and celebrate because the point of that post is that I don't save things for a special occasion because life is the occasion. Oof. I'm I'm definitely on this like every day. That's a every... bar. That's a okay. bar right there. Okay. All right. Obviously, gotta <laughs> love all the positivity. You did mention that there was a bit of negativity. Like anything stood out to you as far as haters? Like, is it similar to the typical old schoolness of professionalism? Like, what, what what do people say? Not a single one was based in professionalism, which is fascinating it was all the hating so you know I did an analysis <laughs> I you know I was like okay I kept I went looked at their profiles see how trolls have things going on in their lives hurt one people, woman was people, you know? hurt people hurt people one woman comes on and is like terrible like you're the ugliest person I've ever seen type thing um I go to her page on LinkedIn and every photo is a sexy photo with one like and it's hers Aww. Oh, si bendito, you know, yeah. you know, one woman said, and she, you know, it's like, you can see where people work. We are on LinkedIn. Yeah. I, sh- I, I shared something that is about showing up as yourself to work when you don't go to an office. I mean, that is the context. It is relevant to that platform. Thirst trap, 40, like, like an older white woman. I'm, I don't know, maybe 50s. I don't know where she's at, but like older white woman. And I'm just struggling with her use of black vernacular. Yo, I was just about to say that I'm impressed that she knew what thirst trap meant. <laughs> I'm not impressed because she was clearly, clearly reaching for some kind of relevance. <laughs> Yo. <that's... laughs> so, you know, I had to call that out. I was like, yeah. you know, my thirst trap is not nearly as appalling. And, and it's not a thirst trap, right? It's me sharing. And I'm very modest. I'm mean, like, I'm, you know, if there was nothing inappropriate, if we want to get into a conversation about inappropriate and unprofessional, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She comes back with how LinkedIn is using me for virality and because sex sells. Wow. And I'm like, I'm like, this went viral because people resonate with it, not because LinkedIn put it forth as some kind of sexy fodder. Yeah, like I wish LinkedIn did pay me for this post. I did this for free. This okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> when it hit a million views, you know, because whatever, I don't do anything online. I was like, you know, it, just seeing the numbers climbing to your point, that didn't mean as much, whatever that happens, the notes. Mm-hmm. And so while I kept track of the seven people that had to come and be smirch, my joyful little project, when I looked at them or it just, it didn't even, it didn't even do anything to me because it's like clearly about something else. 
Yeah. You know, so when I responded to her, she back and eventually she deleted her comment. She just like made pretend the whole um, interaction didn't happen because I told her she was a hater. There's literally nothing to her point. You know, she oh put this on Facebook. You know, that was the other comment. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, who's on that? Facebook. <laughs> okay, Facebook. boomer. <laughs> right. So anyway, the hate was minimal and it was definitely not even coming from workplace or any of what this conversation is about and it was just classic um sad people on the internet yeah no I, I appreciate you sharing that and it's interesting that you had this similar experience with just like people seeing your content and really what's really important are some of those messages that honestly like i want to print all of them out and like fucking frame like frame them and it doesn't have to be like a crazy fr fancy frame but when i get depressed or I feel like I forget my why I want to look at those and just be like that that's why like that's why I get dressed up in the morning that's why I put up the content that I do all of those kind of things because you know in, in this world of like so much negativity going on like you need those you need that validation and those reminders sometimes um to keep going I keep a little I keep a little folder me too on me my too. desktop and on my phone I screenshot Which, all of them. I have it in my phone. Everything. Yeah. Because honestly, the, the where I get the most powerful feedback is anytime I do a panel or speak somewhere, yeah. Yeah. you know, just a lot of first gen, just all kinds of folks who've never seen themselves or someone adjacent, right? I don't like necessarily getting up in front of people. Like I'm really introverted. I, you know, it's not as easy as people think it is just because I do it a lot. <laughs> But man, the feedback about how it changed their career direction or made them have a hard conversation um, with their, you know, parents or just any number of things where I'm like, oh, wow, just moving through the world and sharing your story and, and trying as best as you can to show up really, that's helping someone that's. No, I do think we live in a weird time where everybody feels like they need to be a role model, right? <laughs> I'm just putting this out there in case anybody else is going through this. I have an infection. You know, like yeah, it's, yeah. there's too much information. Like I'm definitely old school. I just know way too much. Like I'm not interested in this level of knowledge about other folks. But, you know, there's a lot of gurus, a lot of like pastel posts mm -hmm. about how you should live your life when really one sentence is a bar mm -hmm. that can shift the change or shift or change the direction you're taking. I did a talk at Creative Mornings on Ripples. That was a theme. They give you a theme and you just do a talk. And it's honestly, I'm not pressed about ever getting the grand can or, you know, any of these awards because I already right now, before I die, already know my impact on a community level. I've gotten to see this person go on to become a doctor. I've gotten to see this person go and, um, you know, get the help they needed and that ripples out and it just keeps, you know, I've affected more people by my little talks and my little things than I ever will with any, you know, $25 million ad um, that's loved because one-on-one -on -one connections are more powerful than anything else. And they spread. You, you've seen a dope thing. You tweeted a dope thing. And somebody else was like, they too had to save it. You know, everybody's got that folder on their phone. Everybody yeah. has those screenshots of that is exactly what I needed to hear right now. Yeah. I always say, uh, you know, people always want to launch companies. They want to launch nonprofits. And they want to do these billion dollar campaigns to, to try to change the world. And I try to tell people that one way simply is to be yourself. To your point, like someone's always watching and they're going to be inspired and maybe even get the permission that they needed or the representation that they needed to be themselves and it creates that ripple effect.